In the summer of 1965, the American poet Allen Ginsberg came to London, and it happened to be, um, it happened to coincide with one or two other of the beat poets. Um, Gregory Corso was there, and Alex Trocchi was there. And they decided to hire the biggest hall they could in London, which turned out to be the Albert Hall, and to put on a poetry event there. It was a very bold move. It was the sort of impossible situation that if you, if you had thought about it for a moment, you would have realised that it wasn't possible to fill up a hall with 6,000 people listening to poetry with about 10 days maximum notice. So I was part of the gang of people who, who decided to do this. My job was to be the photographic press officer. So in, in doing that, I had, I had to set up some um, photo opportunities, is what you call it now, uh, with as many poets as who I could get together on site to get them published in the, in the Sunday papers for the previous weekend. Well, all this went OK. And some of those pictures are extant, and they're shown in the exhibition here. Uh, the event itself turned out to be completely packed out, the Albert Hall full of about uh, estimated 6,000 people, uh, a lot of incense and flowers and uh, um, other substances being smoked. Um, people from all over, many people came from abroad. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really thought to be a success, not necessarily because the poetry was so great, but because it was the first time that there'd been enough, in, enough of us all together in, in the same place to, to look across the hall and say, Jesus, there's, there's 6,000 of us. We only thought there was a few hundred before. So it turned out that was a, that was a turning point in the uh, self-declaration of the, what we then called the underground culture, or just the underground. Um, it turned out that that was a direct precursor to the starting of International Times and the opening of the UFO Club and the 14-hour Technicolor Dream in 1967, which then became the Summer of Love. So the Albert Hall Poetry Reading fits into that flow of, of time. Of course, there were obviously other events that, that fed in as well. I put my cameras down at the end of 1966 because there was so much other stuff going on, and it was either keep photographing or get involved in the doing of the other stuff, you know, the like, club promotion, event promotion, that sort of thing. Um, I was involved with the London Free School in Notting Hill, the UFO Club, the International Times, and other, other stuff. But I, I had to make a choice, and that was, um, that was sort of accelerated, if you like, by the fact that I got thoroughly fed up working for the press barons where I realised that I was just a small cog in a big capitalist machine and I didn't have any choice of the agenda of what I was doing when I was working for them. It was much more exciting to do cultural stuff in the underground. So uh, in order to get on with the, the, with the promotions and that sort of thing, I just didn't have any time to, do, to take photos. Um, unfortunately, soon after that I got busted, which, and, I, got, I landed up in jail for a few months. And when I came out of jail, the situation was quite different and I didn't feel inclined to take any photographs. I, was, I got married, I went abroad, I did some other stuff, and I had to sort of shake off the, the prison dust. Well, I guess it, well, one way of looking at it is to see it as, as in terms of continuity. But in fact, when I next picked up cameras, it was video cameras, and that was in about 1969. And video was such a fascinating medium that uh, I, I spent the next 25 years just, just doing that. And I, and I only took still pictures for advertising purposes, I mean, for advertising our own things or for documentation. I just got to using photography as a tool rather than as a profession. So the next part of my so-called story is to do with video, but that's, that's still to come.
Some people think that the 60s were a golden age, remembering when you could parade down Whitehall with a poet in a coffin held shoulder high on LSD. Some people recall, after the stones were busted, a sit-down in Fleet Street. It held up News of the World distribution vans. It cost them plenty. Some people remember Spies for Peace. They exposed a countrywide network of secret bunkers reserved for the government after a nuclear war. These were acts of imagination and resistance. Try this today and get beaten by armed cops, kettled by the riot squads, arrested for reading out dead soldiers' names. Yes, there were two million of us marched against the war, and it counted for nothing. The corruption of government is complete. Here are images of a more gentle past, but let us not pretend the iron fist was still waiting in the velvet glove, the wheel of state always ready to crush the butterfly of liberty. We must regain our civil liberties by guile, by cunning, by acts of imagination, to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free, defeating the forces of tyranny. This is our message to the digital dervishes of the future. No one can be free while others are oppressed. There is no recipe for freedom. Freedom is a career. You must spy about you with sharp eyes, like a tiger with insatiable craving against tyranny. <laughs>